The Seattle Seahawks are coming off of a tough loss in Seattle against a team that they absolutely should have handled in the New York Giants. They lost 29 to 20. Their defense is banged up. Reek Wolin is going to be out for this Thursday night game against the 49ers. So is Byron Murphy, as well as Derek Hall, Boy Mafe, and Julian Love. But they are looking to correct the ship Thursday night against the 49ers, a prime time Thursday night game on Prime Video. The 49ers are banged up as well. They have guys on both sides of the ball that will be out for this game. And this is a huge matchup for the NFC West moving forward this year. The Seahawks are currently three and two. The 49ers are two and three. Whoever wins this game really determines the next step for the NFC West. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below on this matchup between divisional rivals. Make sure to like and subscribe to the Couch GM for more content like this, and let's get into the podcast. But before we do, the sponsor of this podcast is Black Label Supplements. They are a third-party tested, athlete-approved supplement company based here in the Pacific Northwest. Make sure to check out blacklabelsupplements.com and use code COUCHGM for 15% off your order. And as always, if you or someone you know is thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing a property in the Pacific Northwest, make sure to reach out to myself, Connor Webb, also known as the Couch GM, as I'm a mortgage broker full-time during the day when I'm not making sports videos like this. My contact information will be in the description of this video if you'd like to reach out and connect. And with that, let's get into the podcast. A big Thursday night matchup coming up tomorrow for the Hawks against the 49ers in Seattle. But first, let's, t let's take a look back at this prior week against the New York Giants. This was a, a matchup that we were like, okay, you know, just get through the Giants. You're on to Thursday night. It's going to be a short week. How can they, you know, focus on the 49ers? Well, things did not go as planned in Seattle for, for the Seahawks. And it was kind of a, a summary of the game. You know, the Hawks had a kick that was blocked. That was going to be a, a game tying kick. And it was a guy that was just added to the, uh, special teams this past week apparently and there's also some footage of you know the Giants lineman holding down the Seahawks off offensive lineman so he could jump over the middle I mean just the game all around you know did not go in the Seahawks favor they've got a lot to work on a lot to fix what are your initial takeaways from this 29 to 20 loss in Seattle well the first thing that I'm going to jump on is a lot of people I saw all over Twitter screenshots Look, they're pulling him down, you know, on the D-line. They got over our center. He's not allowed to jump and hit the center. All those things are fine to say and complain about. And I'm not here to dispute, you know. If it is a penalty, I, I think it is. You shouldn't be allowed to grab our guy and yank him down. You should have never been in the situation to where you have to leave the game in the referee's hands. So Seattle can complain all they want about that. But the reason that you were in that spot is because you didn't execute offensively. And frankly, you struggled against the run for the second week in a row defensively. And that worries me. I get it, man. You had guys out. Murphy didn't play. Hall gets banged up in the game. Mafe's banged up. Love gets banged up. Wolin gets banged up in the game. I get it, man. You have injuries. And right now you're beat up. You still got to go make plays. And you can't leave it into the officials' hands. Whether it should have been called or not, that is on you for letting someone else dictate your fate. Dictate your own fate. Run the ball. Do you know how many times the Seahawks ran the ball in this game? 11 times. You cheated, you look. 11 times. Oh, yeah, I got the stats up. <laughs> <laughs> 11 times. 11 times. The Giants. The Giants did it 34 times. Right. Kenneth Walker ran the ball five times. And I get it, man. Gino had a big, like, scamper out, whatever. Throwing the ball. He threw the ball well. I get it. Offensive line, they're struggling, specifically your guards. You threw the ball 40 times. And I get it, man. Grubb wants to air it out. I like what I've seen from the wide receivers, the tight ends, the route combinations that they're running. It feels like, for the most part, they're catching balls. You need to get K-9 the football more because you need to stay balanced. You can't have an 11 to 40 play call differential. You just freaking can't because then teams can tee off. They can start running, you know, defensive blitzes that are meant to stop the pass. They can call in fire zones. They can call in man fires. They can run twists. They can run stunts. They can do all kinds of things to mess with you. Worst case scenario, they can just rush four. Because right now, defensive lines that are just rushing four are beating the Seahawks, and they're specifically beating them up the middle, especially against those two guards. The guard play right now is what's really been holding Seattle back, and that's with a backup right tackle. 
That can't happen. I know you brought in Jason Peters. Jason Peters is eight years past his prime. The problem is, is right now he's still going to help you. So you have to find ways to get your O-linemen in better positions because right now you have what you have. You're not going to be able to go out more than likely and make a big block, big blockbuster trade. Got there. It's late for me. You're not going to go make a big trade right now. You're not going to go trade for Zach Martin. You know, you're not going to go trade and get Creed Humphrey over here so that you can bump him into a guard or bump, you know, Martin over to a guard. You are stuck with what you have. So you now have to start designing plays that can help hide your weaknesses. You got to find ways that you can chip on those guys in the middle. Maybe you have to start trying guys who are backup tackles and bumping dudes into guard because the guard play has been bad. For me, what I'd want to get going right now, run the ball effectively with Kenneth Walker. He had five carries, but he had 19 yards. That's almost for a clip, man. That's not bad. Give K9 and Charbonnet the ball and then use the play action pass specifically where you're getting rollouts with Gino. Gino has been picking teams apart, and I've actually been very impressed with how he's played. But if he's getting constant pressure in his face, that's not going to get guys open later. And I understand. People are going to say, well, Kenneth Walker had seven catches, Will. You're still getting him the ball. To an extent, you need to get him the ball where his offensive linemen are moving forward. That way they're not moving sideways for screen passes or that he's getting little catches out of the backfield on swing passes. I love that we're finding ways to get K-9 the ball in space. I love getting Charbonnet the ball in space. I love that DK is getting six to eight to nine targets a game. I love that Jackson Smith and Jigba is getting more targets a game than they did in Shane Waldron's offense. But right now, your O-line is a problem, and you have to find ways to help protect them. And this score is even a little generous. You know, that first drive of the game for the Giants, they march down the field basically 100 yards, and then they fumble it in the end zone. Seahawks return it for 101-yard fumble recovery. Get that seven points on the board. That's a 14-point swing right there. You know, the Giants were in a much better position potentially than than what the score even shows. And as you mentioned, it's a, it's a great point. You don't have to, you shouldn't have to rely on the refs to be able to win a game like that. And they absolutely should have dominated the game from start to finish. But the Giants were able to put up 420 yards in this game. Uh, Daniel Jones looked uh, solid. Two touchdowns on the day, 257 yards, 23 for 34. They they had a time of possession of 37 minutes, whereas the Seahawks had a time of possession of 22, 38. And this was with, you know, uh, their rookie stud wide receiver Malik Neighbors out. Also running back Devin and Singletary were out. And in their place, um, as you mentioned, and I guess we t- we talked about the offensive line. We need to really talk about the defensive line and, and the the rushing defense because their rookie running back, fifth rounder Tyrone Tracy Jr., had 18 carries, 129 rushing yards, an average of 7.2. Mm-hmm. I mean, this rushing defense needs to be fixed and fixed quickly because you got the 49ers coming in on Thursday night, and uh, you know they've got a solid rushing game. You know, Christian McCaffrey's out. No worries, Jordan Mason's right there. So. You know, what, what do you see on the d- defensive side of the ball for the Seahawks? And why is their rushing game so so poor? Not to defend anyone or not to make excuses. Is, this isn't really defending. It's just excuses. It, you're beat up. You're beat up on the D-line. Williams right now, he's fighting through injuries. You didn't get Murphy in this game at all. Um, or at least, you know, he, he kind of knew he wasn't going to be able to go the whole way through. You're dealing with some issues with Mafe. Hall gets banged up somewhere through there. You know, now Woolen's getting hurt, so they're able to go and pick on you know, your third cornerback out there. I'm not here to make excuses, but that's going to be a small factor in this. Now, while you don't have those guys, other guys have to step up and make plays. Jaron Reed had a couple plays, but again, it felt like, you know, you're you're wishing that you had Jaron Reed from two years ago. The real issue right now is they're getting, you know, knocked off the ball. And then Tracy was just finding open gaps. They're running that zone duo play call there where, the running back just gets to find who wins the one-on-one battle. Like the beauty of true zone, right? Is we all step left and we surge. And that's the simplest way to kind of explain what a zone left would, how it would work. All that the offensive line is trying to do is just have one guy win one battle and everyone else kind of stalemate. If one guy wins a battle where he clearly reaches a D lineman 
well, then there's going to be a hole right off his butt and you can just keep going right off his butt. If no one wins, but everyone moves this way, everyone moves to the left. Well, now he can cut back all the way against the grain for what we call the bend all the way to the right side, you know? And if one guy, the center in the middle, which is his true read when he gets the ball handed to himself on an inside zone, if the center goes for the reach, doesn't get it, washes the guy by, the other guy gets the reach at the uh, left guard position, now you're hitting it right through the middle. So the beauty of the zone is really just one offensive lineman has to win. And if your running back has the vision to see it, you're going to go get three. And they hit so quick half the time, you just kind of have to stalemate, you know? And just stay square and give the running back two lanes to go. D linemen will think that they're going to go to the left, go to block shed, you slam him, cut back right. So right now what's happening is that Seattle's defense isn't plugging up those holes. They're getting either stalemated or they're getting reached or they're getting completely washed out of the zone. And now the gap is a mile wide and you're asking a linebacker to make an open field tackle when the gap is so big. They're just not getting the penetration that they need to on that defensive line. The problem that I'm seeing right now through the air, you don't have the number one wide receiver in New York. It almost looked like a better offense. Darius Slayton missed no steps, took a gigantic step up, eight catches, 122 yards, and a touchdown. And he had 11 targets. But guess what most of his targets were? They were slants. He was destroying... Seattle on slants because Seattle was giving it to him but the problem when you give a slant he's catching that ball he's getting six that's if he falls backwards if he falls forward he runs through you or he breaks a tackle now we're talking about 10 to 12 15 you know and then he has the big catch in there as well so all this to say it feels like in the secondary they're playing back because they don't want to get beat deep because right now they don't trust the D line because you're running with the third and fourth string guys because the first and second string guys are hurt right now. When you saw Seattle's defensive line flying around and making a bunch of big plays, that's when everyone is healthy. So it does worry me a little bit about the true depth of this defensive line. You got to get healthy. Unfortunately, you're going to be missing two of your big key factors possibly a third, right? In this game, you're going to go play San Francisco. You're not going to have Nuosu. Now, you haven't really had him for the whole year, but it would be nice to have an edge rusher like that. You're not going to have Murphy in the middle. And that's been the biggest issue when you see the run game start to work for other teams. When Murphy has been out and you haven't had that two-headed monster of Williams and Murphy, Seattle hasn't been able to get enough penetration on that interior defensive line that has slowed down running games, that has allowed teams to get into third and manageables where it is third and four and you can run the six-yard slant because you only need four and you're going to get two extra, right? They need to do better on the interior line. This is why you drafted the kid. The problem is he's hurt and you're not going to get to use him. The other one that really is going to be a big issue is you're going to be without Julian Love in this game, probably. He's a game-time decision you kind of have to go into it like you're not expecting him to play. And even if he does play, you're not going to get full strength Julian Love. What Julian Love's been doing this year, he's the MVP of your defense. He's dropping back in coverage. He's playing in the box. If he's not your leading tackler, he's your second leading tackler. He's gotten an interception. He's forced turnovers. He is doing everything. He's covering tight ends. He's covering wide receivers. He's coming, covering running backs out of the backfield. He is the most important player of your defense, and you're not going to have him in this game. That is a big deal, especially when you play a Shanahan offense that is going to use their fullback, that is going to use their running back, that's going to use their tight ends and their wide receivers in a bunch of different variations. They're going to find a way to run the ball with someone that you've never heard of. They're going to find a way to have that Kyle Juszczyk game where all of a sudden you're like, did Kyle Juszczyk just catch five passes for 50 on us and two touchdowns? What the hell? Like you're going to have those games because Shanahan is going to scheme up ways to defeat you. The reason you went out and you got McDonald was to beat Shanahan. He's known as the Shanahan stopper. But now you're going to see his defense 75%. Is that good enough to stop a 49ers team that is probably at about 80%. Yeah, you mentioned those short passes with uh, Darius Slayton. I remember from week one talking about Bo Nix coming to Seattle and th their attack. The potential weakness that we saw was in the was in the linebacker, that middle area. So mm -hmm. relying on the short passes. Now with the defensive line also being 
a, a weakness. Now the rushing game is exposed. The short game is exposed. The, the, the true strength is the secondary. Some of those guys are a little banged up. So the, the Seahawks defense definitely isn't in a great spot and kind of transitioning into, you know, this upcoming matchup Thursday against the 49ers and and you have a NFC West opponent that is a little banged up themselves. Um, you know, Christian Caffrey is out probably for the season, but as I mentioned, Jordan Mason has stepped right in and been a dog. He's been exactly what the 49ers have needed. You got Brock Purdy at, at quarterback who's doing his thing. This is going to be another real test for the, for the Seahawks to see if they can put something together and, and slow down this potential offensive juggernaut right now. The 49ers are predicted to have a 61.6% chance of winning. Seahawks are at 38.1 as the 49ers are favored right now by three and a half. Yeah, that that sounds right to me. Um, the 49ers have found weird ways to lose games this year and uh, to a little bit of a degree, especially in uh, the Patriots game, the CX have found kind of weird ways to win games. Um, you're also, it's in Seattle. So you have to factor in, you know, the Lumen field advantage. So that's going to be a big deal. For me, as I'm scrolling, trying to find the 49ers uh, injury report, it's going to be about which second string player can make the big jump, right? Which second string player can make the big play? Right now, when you look at their defense, they're not at 100% either. Obviously, Dre Greenlaw, like that dude wasn't going to play until the end of the year, right? He had a big injury in the Super Bowl. That's a big deal because Dre Greenlaw – is kind of the KJ Wright to Fred Warner's Bobby Wagner. When one of those two was out in Seattle, you saw a big, not a big drop off in performance, but instead of Bobby feeling free to go and make a risk and try and go get an interception or try and make a big play in the backfield because he knew he had KJ covering him on the backside, he didn't do that. So instead of a typical Bobby Wagner two yard loss tackle, it was a Bobby Wagner two yard gain tackle. You know, now he's knocking the ball down instead of getting the interception. And so that's kind of the same thing that Warner is dealing with right now. Javon Hargrave, right? He's out. He's got the tricep injury. So they're missing their top three tech that would do the exact same thing that Murphy would do, except at a higher level because he's done it before. He's been in the league for so long. He got paid all the big money. So that's going to be a problem for them. As you're going through, it looks like, Traverius Ward, he's questionable for the game. That's your top cornerback. So it's not like we're going to come out here. They don't even have Hufanga, right? So we're not going to go out here and say that this 49er team isn't dealing with injuries, just like the Seahawks are, right? Both teams are injured. If you're Seattle, you need this game. You're one game up on San Fran. If you win this football game, you really go from one game to three because you now have the tiebreaker, at least for a while, on San Francisco. If you are both hurt and you can get that win, it puts you miles ahead because some of these guys for San Francisco, they're not coming back. Where in Seattle's case, you're going to get those guys back. They're not going on IR. They're only going to be out for another couple weeks. So you can gain a game, really two, in a situation where if San Francisco is fully healthy, you're going, there ain't no shot we got in this one. It's what Arizona was able to do last week. Arizona, if they lose that game to San Francisco, you're talking about, well, maybe, you know, we start looking at next year. Like, this is okay. We'll be frisky. We'll knock a team or two out of the playoffs. But the real year is next year. You win that game against San Francisco, all of a sudden, well, we're we're only a game out. Like, all of a sudden, we're looking better. We just need a couple games, go our way. And you're about to go through a very difficult part of the schedule for Seattle. They need to win this game. That being said, San Francisco too. You need to win this game because you've never been more hurt, right? You've never had more issues. And if you can beat Seattle in this spot, you're now first place in the division. Or at least tied, uh, depending on what Arizona does. So if you're Seattle, you got to have this one because the schedule doesn't get any easier. You go play Atlanta, tough game. They look really good. You go play Buffalo. That's never fun. You get the Rams, and then you get San Francisco again. The schedule doesn't get any easier. You need to take care of this one. You need this one bad. And you needed the one last week against New York, and you didn't take care of business. You better right the ship. 
Otherwise, all of a sudden, that nice 3-0 and start that you had, that thing's completely gone and you're a 500 team. This is a potential big swing for both teams this week. You know, if Seattle wins, they move up to four and two. San Francisco would drop to two and four versus if the 49ers win, both teams are even at 500, three and three. The 49ers so far this year, they currently are two and three. Their, their, their first week to get the win versus the Jets. Then they had really their three, their three losses are by one score. They could have won all of those games. The first one was at Minnesota. They lost 23 to 17. Then they lost at the Rams by just a field goal, 27 to 24. And then most recently, as you mentioned, against the Cardinals, they lost 24 to 23. So this is a team that has been right there on the doorstep. Like you mentioned, the, the Seahawks need to finish these teams like the Giants because there are the teams like the 49ers that they're going to be seeing a few times this season. This is going to be a big one. What are your right. keys to the game for, for both teams? Well, it sounds so dumb, but stop the run. You have to. If you're in Seattle, you have to stop the run. And look, I get it's easier said than done. And there is a certain point where it's Shanahan, he's going to get some yards, especially since I don't see Debo Samuel on any injury report. I've been looking. I feel like the guy's healthy. He played there. last week. He's healthy. He's back. They're going to use him in some way. He's going to get five carries. He's going to get four or five swing passes where they just want to get the ball to his hands in space. That terrifies me. He always feels like he's a big Seattle Seahawks killer. But you got to stop Mason first. Like, if you force them to get into their bag of tricks with Debo early, that could set you up nice. It also gets the crowd involved. There's nothing worse in Lumen than when the crowd gets taken out early. I can't remember if it was Thanksgiving or maybe it was, like, getting real close to Christmas time. But Seattle had a primetime game against San Francisco in Lumen. And San Francisco scored on their first two drives. It was 14-0. Seattle hadn't scored, hadn't even really moved the ball. And that place was deafening quiet. You need the loudness. You need the adversity that the other team on the road has to go through. It helps in some way. And I'm not here to say, well, it's a three-point advantage or a four-point or whatever. When you can't hear the play call, and you as a quarterback are having a hard time getting the play call out to everyone, can you fully trust that he got the call and he got the call and this happened? That's when dumb mistakes happen because Purdy sees something, he audibles, tackle doesn't get it, free comes Mafe for a big hit. Those are the things that that crowd can do, and you need to keep them involved early. There's a reason why the 12s are the best in the NFL when it comes to fan bases like that. You got to be able to keep them in it, and to do that, you got to get stops. And then I think you need to run the football, man. Right now, if you just keep dropping Geno back 40, 50 times a game, not that Geno can't get it done. It's that other teams can start to tee off on this offensive line. And right now they've struggled. Look, I think Cross, you're solid. He's going to lock down that left tackle position. You're fine. But when it comes to your guards, that's where I'm fearful. Guess who got the, you know, the field goal blocked? So you're starting left guard. Yeah, give it. You gave up seven sacks to the Giants. Correct me if I'm wrong. 10, 10 QB hits, seven sacks. Correct me if I'm wrong. Like, they weren't coming into the game like, this is the best pass rush team I've ever seen. You know? There's a guy with the last name Bosa on the 49ers that uh, you got to watch for. Yeah. Stone Forsyth has to have a big game because I'll tell you right now, they're going to move him to that side. That's what I would do. I would move him to that side and let him go and attack. You did a decent job against Aiden Hutchinson, but even he still had some plays. You know what I'm saying? Now, he didn't have four sacks, but he still made some plays. You got to find a way to slow down that pass rush, and I think the best way is to get the run game going, and then you can use the play-action pass off of it. Now, you don't have to go full Pete Carroll where it's dive right, dive left, third and eight, pass. But you got to find a way to get the offensive line moving forward. Yeah, I think some great points there. The first off, it's stopping Jordan Mason. You know, he, he's he been solid this year. And then Debo Samuel is back. He's fully healthy. But, sure. you know, now that Debo is back, that takes, a, a you know, some pressure off of Brandon Ayuk. And last week against the Cardinals, he had eight receptions, 147 yards, averaging 18.4. No touchdowns. But the 49ers have that passing, that passing mm -hmm. game. They've got the rushing game. This is going to be a true test for the Seahawks. And then, I agree. Like you mentioned, you know, the Seahawks need to get the running game established. They need to get canine Charbonnet, the ball more often. 
when they do get the ball, it's been solid so far. You know, work in the running game that pulls out the, the play action, and then you got the deep ball whenever you need it. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a great game tomorrow, thir Thursday night. If you're watching this on Thursday, it'll be at 515 on Prime Video, Lumen Field, game time weather. It's supposed to be 63 and cloudy. So make sure to tune in. Appreciate you all for, for watching. Thank you, Will, for joining me, and we'll see you on the next one.